Good afternoon. My name is Linda L., and I'm a grateful member of Al-Anon. Uh, Thank you, Linda K. I didn't know we'd travel together on tape, and I'm always thinner on tape, don't you think? <laughs> oh, I, um, I was doing just fine until we started this meeting, and I kept seeing more and more people come in. I mean, wouldn't you rather go to the pool? I mean, it's a gorgeous day out there. Uh, I appreciate you, you being here, and I'm, I'm, I'm anxious, and... Uh, I notice that you give your home group. I'd like to say that my home group in Nashville, Tennessee, is the Monday Midday Downtown Al-Anon Family Group. And they're here with me. They gave me this little safety pin. But um, I think in our group it's just kind of the low-budget guardian angels. (laughs) So I brought a few safety pins from them, and you're welcome to get one just to keep you safe. And any time you see a safety pin in your glove compartment, in your purse, in your uh, closet, you'll know that you're having a hello and a hug from Nashville, Tennessee. So, so that's my home group. Yeah, they're great. <laughs> and I tell you, that home group and the sponsor and Working the Steps has taught me to ask for what I need. So I need to ask for something, and that's another moment of silence. Um, Like we had in the meeting before we said the serenity prayer, we had the moment of silence. I would like to ask for another moment of silence. And Lois Wilson, who was married to Bill, she was the co-founder of Al-Anon. Somebody asked her one time what she did in that moment of silence. And she said, I invite God to the meeting. So if you'd be willing to have another moment of silence and... uh, and let me kind of get settled and let me remember to breathe. And, um, and if you'd be willing to ask the God of your understanding to come and be here with us, um, I think that would make it have a really fun time. So please, a moment of silence. Thank you. Now, I'm not up here by myself. I've got the God of my understanding. I I feel like I've got all the people that were in the rooms when I got here. All of our stories are our stories personally, and they're, you know, the things we've heard at meetings, just repeated in our own language. I'd like to thank the committee for inviting me here. Uh, I think that Orlando is a perfect place to, uh, to have an AA conference when you're next door to dopey, goofy, and grumpy. <laughs> I, think it's, I think we're right where we're supposed to be. <laughs> and, and what I was thinking about today as I was walking around, that, that that really is the unreal world. And in here, in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous, and in the rooms of Al-Anon, and in the rooms of Alateen, that really is the real world where we have a chance to get real. Yeah. <laughs> so I'd like to thank the committee. I'd like to thank Linda. She's just been such a gracious host, and she's introduced me to new friends for life, like Lady Terry. And I'm just, just thank you. Some of the best meetings happen right outside the ladies' room or <laughs> while you're having lunch. So this has been a, a, a really fun time for me until right now, you know. <laughs> We, my husband and I, I, I uh, call Scott my now and forever husband. You'll see he's also my third husband. You'll see that in my story or hear that in my story. But we like going to conferences. We go to a lot. We got to go to Toronto, and before that we got to go to Minneapolis, and then we got to go to San Diego. We like to go to the big, big birthday parties, the internationals. And um, I had qualified. I could have gone to Seattle, the one that happened before San Diego, but I just didn't have my act together enough to do that. So San Diego was my very first international, not, not my first conference, because I, I think we come together to speak the language of the heart and to have a good time and to hear the laughter. I think that, you know, we, we may have given up the drink, but we're not giving up the party, you know. <laughs> That's why we have these gatherings like this. So uh, Scott and I are on our way from Nashville, Tennessee, to go out to San Diego to, the, the, to my first international. And when we get to the airport, we run into some people that we knew from meetings. You know, that made sense. They'd made plans to go out there to the big birthday party, too. And I think that flight left Nashville and stopped in in St. Louis. And some of the earthlings got off 
you know, the regular people got off. And so more of us got on. You could tell because they had the jewelry with the circles and the triangles on them. So the last leg of this big, huge jet going out to San Diego was absolutely packed up with people going out to the, to the I think that was like this in the 70th birthday for AA. And, and um, by the time, or maybe 65, that's right, it was 65, okay, the 65th birthday. And, uh, you know, I'm not good with numbers. I'll turn 60 this year, but you won't hear me say that again. <laughs> um, so the, the last part of that flight, I, I'm back at the back of the airplane, and, and I start uh, talking to the flight attendant because, you know, she's working, and, and I'm, I'm planning this big holiday. I'm in a really good mood. So I'm waiting my turn to get into the ladies' room, and I start chatting with her, and I said, well, how's it going? Are you, are you having a good day? And she says, well, yes. She said, um, I am having a good day. She said, uh, every single seat is taken. She said, we're very, very busy. We have never served so much coffee. <laughs> That's us, you know. So when we got to San Diego, they encouraged us to wear our badges everywhere. And if you've noticed that, when we're in the elevator and you see somebody with a badge on, don't you have a little secret wink you can give them? You know, don't we know that we've, we've, we're in the, the, in, the, in the deal? So we wore our badges every place. And Scott and I, before it actually started, we got to go out to SeaWorld. And as we were getting out of a taxi... There were two Japanese men and a Japanese woman that had badges on that they wanted to get into the taxi. And we stood there on the curb. They had absolutely no English. We had no Japanese. And we stood there on the curb, and we had a five-minute conversation. (laughs) We bobbed. We hugged. We cried. We pointed to our badges. And and we knew knew without a doubt that that we were speaking the language of the heart. And it was a strong lesson that this deal, this disease of alcoholism, crosses all kinds of borders. Skin color, economic, what's in the bank, it, it crosses everything. And that was a wonderful lesson to know that recovery also crosses all kinds of borders. You know, it's a wonderful deal. I was invited to be on one of the panels in San Diego, not, not like today, like I'm telling my story, but... Several months ahead of time, I was given a specific topic that I was supposed to share about 15 minutes on with four other people, and we were going to make up a little discussion panel. Now, when I got my assignment, I chuckled. It was living with sobriety after the honeymoon's over. (laughs) Yeah. I thought, since I'm in my third marriage, they want me to tell them about how to plan a honeymoon here, you know? (laughs) Because I've had some great honeymoons. Some honeymoons have almost lasted longer than some of the marriages. <laughs> but here I am. I get that assignment, and, and I really think I did a good job. I did my homework, because Al-Anon addresses this living with sobriety very well in our literature. We have a pamphlet called The Dilemmas of the Alcoholic Marriage that's great. I don't care what program you're in, you get your hands on it. I don't care if you're even in a marriage. It's a great way to how to communicate with other human beings. We've got sex and intimacy, a little pamphlet. I mean, we've got some literature around this topic. So being a good Al-Anon, I did my homework, and I had what I was going to say, and I had it all worked out. And then when I got there that day, I cannot tell you one thing I said. Because the woman in front of me, when she introduced herself, she told my entire Al-Anon story. Now, I'd been in Al-Anon about seven years at this time. And what she said when she introduced herself, she said, she, she said, Hello, my name is so-and-so, and I'm from Georgia. <laughs> I'm a member of Al-Anon, and I am addicted to mood-altering men. I thought, oh, that's why I've been going to all these meetings. I get it, you know. And, and thanks to Al-Anon, it's not a character defect. It's a gift, you know. I just have a tendency to pick out this wonderful personality, this living on the edge, this enthusiasm, even drinking or not drinking, this great personality. I just absolutely love alcoholics. And I'm very, very good at picking them out. In fact... 
Scott says, I'm so good at it that it's a gift that I could use in our community there in Nashville, Tennessee. This is a true story. For my birthday several years ago, he gave me about 500 business cards. He said, you know, if you're at the dry cleaners or you're at the grocery store and you look over there and you kind of see somebody you're attracted to, he said, you could hand him one of these cards. He said, it would really help recovery here in our community. <laughs> I said, okay, here's the card. The front of it has a couple of butterflies, very appropriate for al has my name, my phone number, that sort of thing. The back of it says this, hi, my name is Linda. I am a member of Al-Anon. I find you attractive, so I suggest you go to the nearest treatment center and have an assessment done. (laughs) He said, just think how much time that would save. You know... (laughs) Um, I think you should stand up. In Al-Anon, we don't give advice. You're going to get to hear my husband tonight. I'm going to give you some advice. Fasten your seatbelt. You do this to me all the time. Stand up, Mr. Scott. (laughs) I'd hand you a card in a second, honey. (laughs) Okay, so I have this gift of being attracted to this certain type of personality. And I don't have to apologize for it. I would tell you the the first person that I could probably say that won my heart over is my dad. You know, I've known my dad all my life. And uh, I've seen my dad drink almost every day of my life. And I've seen him drunk a lot of days of my life. He's now in his 70s and he's still drinking. And I've seen my mother wait. I don't know what she's waiting for. Maybe for him to sober up waiting for him to come to dinner, waiting for him to say, you're more important than the drink. I don't know what she's waiting for, because that's their story. They've been married over 50 years, and they've been doing the dance a long time. But I didn't know that this being attracted to my dad would have an effect on me. I grew up out in Odessa, Texas. Um, There's a movie out now under the Friday Night Lights. That's my hometown, Odessa. I guess there was only two things to do, football and drink, because there seemed to be a lot of that going on. And uh, it was, a, it was a, actually a pretty wholesome place and a wholesome time to grow up. I graduated from high school in 1964. I, went, I stayed there in Odessa and went to the junior college. And the um, thing about being an only child is that my parents were able to give me a lot of stuff. I'm talking really nice stuff. They were children of the Depression, and they made a fine, fine living. My dad always made a fine living. And they could give me my own room. They gave me a nice car. When I was in high school, I always had nice clothes and nice shoes because the budget didn't have to be separated with a lot of brothers and sisters. They wanted to give me things they didn't have, and they did a great job. They also did know that they couldn't give me some things they didn't have, and possibly that was the beginning of the disease of alcoholism. It's multi-generation in their histories. It's you know very tragic, and I sometimes wonder if uh, parts of my story will, will change. Um, after my parents, you know, passed. I I just don't know. They have a very tragic history. So how could they give me love? It was easier to buy me a new dress. How could they give me support on trying to make decisions or, or skills? And as far as my dad's drinking was concerned, it was always in a very elaborate setting. He was a successful businessman, and he had to entertain people, and we'd take them out to dinner, and they'd have fine wines, and they'd have drinks, and then they'd have the after-dinner drinks that were so cute and clever, and we'd drink out at the country club. And I could not have told you that my dad's drinking was causing problem in that family of the mom, the dad, and the daughter any more than I could have said, man, eating macaroni and cheese is really wrecking this family because it was a daily way of life. It was as much a part of our life as oxygen. And I think during that time, uh, I started getting what I call step zero, and that's the hollowness that happens right here in our gut. I've heard it said time and time again in both programs. I had a hole in my gut, in my soul, that could not be filled, and I needed it to be filled. And I think that was step zero for me. And... um, I decided to stay there in Odessa, and I, and I went to this junior college, 
and I'm still living at home, and I didn't know I wanted to get out of that household because it seemed like a really nice household. And until I got into Al-Anon as an adult and got my hands on some of the Alateen literature, that's how I figured out some of the things that were going on in that house. So if you, as an adult, get your hands on some of the Alateen pop quiz, a little question, has your life been affected by someone else's drinking, little 20 questions, and maybe you'll have a little bit of understanding of why you didn't do so well on that math test in the seventh grade. Because when I was at school, I'd be wondering about what was going on at home. And when I was at home, I'd be wondering on, wondering on how to get out of there as fast as I could. So I'm going to this junior college. I don't know I want to get out of that household, but I've got this zero in my gut. And I look over and I see this young man, and boy, my heart went pitter-patter. Could have handed him one of those business cards, you know. And evidently something in him went pitter-patter because in two weeks he asked me to marry him. And uh, back in 1964, I had been a good girl for about as long as I could be. So (laughs) things were a little different then. And so my parents, within six months, gave us a storybook wedding. Now, they opposed it. When we went to tell them we wanted to get married, they started asking really bothersome questions like, you know, we said, we want to get married. And they'd say, don't you think you should have a job first? And we'd go, hmm. That's just details. We'll work it out, you know, because we were in love. We were in passion. And so we have the storybook wedding with the long white dress um, that, I, that I deserve to wear. And I go down the middle aisle and the storybook wedding, and we live happily ever after for the first week. <laughs> and then to celebrate our being married for one week, we were still college students. My husband brought home two of his best friends. I think Cliff was probably in his history class or his English class, and in between them, they brought in their best friend, Bud, in the cooler. And so I watched my husband and his best friend celebrate our one year of marriage by having a lot to drink. And I saw the friend kind of go to sleep or pass out on our couch. We're living in uh, college student housing, married student housing, so you know that this table was bigger than our apartment. And so the friend kind of falls asleep there, and my husband kind of passes out or falls asleep in our bed, and I did the pre-Alanon stance. I stood in the middle of the floor, and I looked at all the falling trees, and I thought, I'm not going to let him get away with that. I'm going to show him he can't get drunk and pass out on our anniversary night. I will show him. I always had a plan. You know, Call it control, call it an agenda, call it an itinerary, call it whatever you want. But I always had a plan that if I followed this plan, things would be different. That night I had a brilliant plan. To punish my husband for passing out on our anniversary and passing out on our bed, that night I slept in the bathtub. (laughs) It was so logical at the time, you know. (laughs) The, the friend was on the couch. There wasn't any place else to go. And, you know, the next morning, my husband wakes up with a headache, a hangover, and I wake up with a backache. And that was the dance that we did for 16 years and two lovely daughters. You know, he was going to act this way, and I'm going to meh, 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 and show him that he can't get away with it, and I would do something else. Now, this young man, uh, as long as we were college students, we were traveling all over Texas, as long as you change a uh, change different colleges, change universities, change your major. You can stay a student for a long time. And he never did really have a job, but then one day he accidentally got a job. And what happened, he was at his favorite bar drinking, and they said, we would like to start a a lounge act here. And he says, well, I can sing and play the guitar. So he drove home and got it. He came back and he auditioned, and all of a sudden he is an entertainer in the music business at the local saloon. And he was very well received, and he started making more money than we had seen in months and months. And now he's got a career. And when he finished that particular job, another Holiday Inn invited him to come sing there. And by this time, we got married in 65. Our first daughter was born in 1968. She was about a year old. And uh, he started traveling all over Texas to these different hotels, singing and performing. And I, I did not think that this husband should go off without adult supervision. So I packed up the baby. 
I packed up the hot plate. I packed up the diapers, the toys, a couple of books, and some clothes. And we started being gypsies with him, traveling all over. And now our life is we're living upstairs in the hotel rooms. He's going down to work every night. He would come home from work, and he'd kind of act like, look like, and smell like he'd been to a party. But since it was work, it must be okay. And I'm upstairs night after night waiting for him to come back from his work party. And I'm getting kind of bored. And, again, I had a brilliant plan. I announced to him one Friday, I said, hey, I'm going to be the drummer in the band. (laughs) He said, have you ever played drums before? And I said, that's just details. We'll work it out. (laughs) That Saturday... I took the bass player to a pawn shop, and for 50 bucks, I bought a whole trap set of drums. I'm talking a bass drum, two ride toms, a floor tom, a hi-hat, a crash cymbal, a snare drum. Monday night, I was the drummer in the band. (laughs) You cannot tell me we are not determined people, you know. (laughs) We were having a conversation about it. It had nothing to do with music. It had to do with me being able to keep an eye on him while he was at work. (laughs) So here we are, now very successful in Texas. We're traveling all over. We got really well known, and we're 30 days at this hotel playing, and then we'd travel to uh, Houston, 30 days there, back to Dallas, 30 days there. And meanwhile, my daughter is upstairs with the babysitter. Most of the time I wouldn't even know her name. It was that the hotel innkeeper had gotten his niece or somebody to come. But I thought I was a good mom because any time we'd have after hours, that meant that the law said you had to stop serving alcohol, but we were the party place afterwards. We would lock the door. Whoever was in concert or in tour or the other bands or other musicians would come to where we were, and we would make music all night long. And the babysitter would eventually have to go home. She's a high school girl. She's got to go to school the next day. And I thought I was a great mom because I would go upstairs And I would take the telephone off the hook, and I'd put it beside her, and then I'd go downstairs in the bar, and I'd take that phone off the hook. And every now and then I'd go over and listen to see if that that young girl was awake. And I, I tell that story because it shows how I neglected her, but I thought that I was really doing okay as far as she was concerned. You know, the possibility of a fire, of somebody breaking into that room, or her just waking up and being afraid... That, that, didn't even, that didn't even cross my mind because I'm downstairs with my husband and his buddies making music all night long, pray, playing the drums, and aren't I, aren't I a great wife? Now, in the 16 years of marriage, there were times that we did not have an address at all. And we also moved 13 times from one city to the other. And what that keeps is you keeps you isolated. You have to put up new money for the phones, the electric bill, the gas bill, and you don't get to know anybody. And your husband's going to come to you one day and say, this isn't working here, let's move to Houston. And, you know, I'd say, okay. Because it wasn't that he was trying to set me up. It was really that he was trying to outrun the disease. And I saw hope in his eye every single time. It wasn't that he was a bad husband or a bad dad. He really was trying to do what he thought was best. And when I first got into Al-Anon, I I learned that those were called geographic cures, that we pack it up and we think it's going to be on better on down the road. And what we know is that we pack up everything with the dishes and the books and the kids' toys. We pack up the disease and we move it on down the road. I gave you my statistics. They seemed pretty severe. 16 years of marriage, 13 major moves. At times, we didn't even have an address. That seems pretty severe to me. If you look at the history books, Lois and Bill Wilson, before they settled in Stepping Stone, had 52 different mailing addresses. We desperately try to outrun this disease. Desperately try to outrun it. So we finally had kind of come to the wit's end, and we um, ended up in Nashville, Tennessee, and I'm thinking this is the end of the moves because a songwriter, where else could he be? but in Nashville, Tennessee, and I moved to Nashville about 29 years ago. And my thought was, how can you feel like you're going home to a place you've never lived? That was also my thought when I first got into Al-Anon. How can this feel so right to a place that I've never even been to before? So here we are in Nashville, Tennessee, and the music business is pretty serious. And sometimes the progression of the disease gets pretty serious, too. And the party became more important than taking care of business. And this man that I was married to was disillusioned. 
And he came in one day and he announced, get packed, we're going back to Texas. And I have to tell you that I could not. I was absolutely all used up. I was so very old. And I said, I can't. And he did the trump card on me. He said, I guess we get a divorce. Now, he had threatened that card before, and I'd always say, okay, I'm in, I'm in, whatever, you know. And this time he said, I guess we get a divorce, and I said, I guess we do, because I was absolutely, totally used up. So he put all of his music instruments in the car. Um, the, the man next door was an attorney, and for 50 bucks he handled our divorce, and he took off, and he went back to Texas. And I wish him the very best, because he is the natural father of my children. He still lives in Texas. He's married a young woman. They're raising another family. And I wish him the very best every day. I keep him in my prayers. Because the healthier and happier he is, the better the exchange would be with my girls. Meanwhile, it's my story. And we're the family in the rearview mirror. Here's what we look like. The mom whose resume says drummer in the band. <laughs> The, the pre-teenage daughter and, and a three-year-old. And um, the attorney that handled the divorce says, you're going to need a, a job. I suggest you go down to the 25th floor of the First American Center and apply for this job. This man is looking for someone to manage his office. It's commercial real estate, and he needs an office manager. I did not know my controlling skills could convert to a business skill. <laughs> I went down there, and I often say I auditioned for the job because that's all I'd ever done before. I'd always auditioned. I'd never had an interview. So I interviewed for the job. I got the job, and I started managing this office. I started managing shopping centers, and I started managing to believe that I could make a lot of money. I got my affiliate broker's license. I got my broker's license, and I thought I'm going to make sure my daughters and I live happily ever after because I'm going to put the zeros in the bank. I absolutely thought that's all we needed to do. So I'm starting out there, and I'm making lots of money, and I'm doing really big deals, and I'm in a, in a world that I'm very successful in. And I have to tell you that I turned my back on my family the way anybody would with a drunk or a drink. I'd call my daughters at home. They're still, one of them's not even a teenager yet. I'd call them, and I'd, this is the message I would give them. Y'all just stick something in the microwave because mom has some clients in from out of town. They're very important, and I'm going to have to take them out to dinner. So the message I gave them is th these people are more important than you are. But I thought I was being a great mom because I was really, really putting the money in the bank. But one Christmas, we get the Christmas pictures back, and I look at them, and here's the mom, and here's the teenage girl, and here's the little girl, and, man, we don't look happy. What's missing from this picture? A man. <laughs> That's right. I'm now in my mid-30s, didn't think I had a lot of time, so I married my boss. <laughs> now, he'd been asking me out, but he was married at the time, and he kept saying, That's just details. We'll work it out. <laughs> so, so here is the true Cinderella story. I mean, listen to the telling of this. This is a man that marries his secretary, who's gone on to be a vice president of a company, started my own company with his head company, and became president of my own company. Uh, uh, somebody, you know, a story that's made good. I'm bringing in lots of money. He marries me. He adopts my two daughters. He moves us into a mansion. I can tell you it was a mansion because it had six bathrooms. That is a mansion. It had a really nice address, and it, it was an unbelievable story. And, and we're going to live happily ever after. My daughters are going to private school. We have the newest cars that come off of the, the whatever cars come off of, <laughs> the runway. What do cars come off of? <laughs> and, um, and we're in all of the proper clubs, like Friends of the Wine, you know, the 100 Euro Cognac Club. We had a wine cellar that would rival a small restaurant. I mean, because it was for charity. You know, we'd go to these wine auctions and you'd get all this. I mean, we are living happily ever after. Not. Something very strange was going on in that household. I would go to my friends and I'd say, something really scary is going on here. And I, I just can't get my, my finger on it. And they'd look at my lifestyle and the travels that I was going to Europe and down to South America, and, and they'd go, 
what do you have to complain about? And I'd go, hmm, that's right. What do I have to complain about? I'd go to my doctor and I'd say, I really think I'm going crazy. Something, something's not right here. And he'd look at my address and he'd say, what do you have to complain about? So I'd go away. I'd go to neighbors. I'd go to other people. And what I could not exactly put my finger on was this man I can share with you because he shared it. Not only was he an alcoholic, he was also a cocaine addict. And uh, not only was he a cocaine addict, he was also a cocaine entrepreneur. Now, what that means, (laughs) when you have a nice address, you are an entrepreneur. When your address isn't so nice, you are a drug dealer. Okay? So some very strange things were happening in that household. I just couldn't figure it out, and some of the people that, that came by, I just, I, I honestly, or, or maybe it was denial, maybe it was the safety of denial, but we started having some horrible fights, some horrible arguments. I didn't want to mess up my happy ever after, so I drugged this man, kicking and screaming, into marriage counseling. I had picked this doctor out of the phone book. And I would say, we're going to go talk to him because, you know, we had too much at stake. We had a business together. We now were parenting together. We now have that household together. You know, I could throw a party for a sit-down, seven-course meal for 16 people with two hours' notice, but I couldn't figure out what was going on in my, in my life with my husband. So I took him into marriage counseling, and we'd go talk to this doctor, and we'd go in, and, and I would start crying. I would start weeping. I would be hysterical. And I couldn't tell you why. I mean, I'm just falling apart, falling apart. And my husband, being so open and so happy to be there, he would totally cross his arms, lean back in his chair, and close his eyes. And here we would sit. And the doctor, after a time, I saw him many, many times. He would, I guess, get bored, and he would very carefully pick up a paper clip, and he would undo it, and he would twirl it around, And then he would look at his watch and he'd say, oh, you're out of time. He said, we've we've got to go. And he said, you're too sensitive and you're not sensitive enough and go away. And so we'd go away until we'd have another fight. And then we'd go back in there. I'd cry. He'd shut down. He'd twirl the paper clip. We'd go away. And this is what we would do for several years trying to figure out what was wrong with this marriage. We would also go on these little honeymoon trips, you know, and we'd gone on a really nice honeymoon trip. It was um, Valentine's Day. In fact, we'd come down to the Miami airport. And the long and short of it is we were down there with another couple. Well, actually, the guys had gone down a couple of days early to get ready for our vacation. You can figure that one out, okay? So the girlfriend and I show up, and we, uh, do, we do a wonderful road trip down to the lower Florida Keys. You know those road trips, those road trips with the capital R. It was a party on wheels all day long. It didn't have any food. I'd just done a really big deal, and I was exhausted. And we finally get down in the lower Florida Keys, and we're at a nice restaurant. I know it was a nice restaurant because it had tablecloths on it. I I remember that. I don't remember the name of it. And, um, And I said something at the table, and it was wrong. I either said, pass the salt, please, or please pass the salt. But, but I saw the monster of the disease show up in my husband's face, and I knew that there was going to be a public scene. I knew it was going to be loud, and I knew it was going to be ugly because we had lived those before. And something in me snapped. I stood up, and I said, I'm going home. And they go, fine. They think I'm going back to the hotel, but I, I am going home. And this is actually my, my bottom. I think this is my bottom, that I started a run. I was physically trying to outrun the disease. And I go over to the registers, uh, the check cashier's desk, and I said, I need a telephone. And I call. I'd seen it in the movies. I call, and I said, I need a cab. A cab came. We're in one of those wonderful small towns that probably has four city blocks. And this little taxi driver thinks he's going to take me a couple of blocks over. He shows up, and I said, I need you to take me to the Miami airport. And he goes, okay. And I, I don't even know. I was so upset, I didn't even notice. But all of a sudden, I'm going home with this taxi driver. Now, I'm a pretty sophisticated traveler, but I'd never done that. I'd never been home with the cab driver. And about the time that I should be concerned, we pull up, and his wife opens the door, and she says, Honey, he can't take that cab to Miami. He's got to get the bigger van. He's got to fill it up with gas. You come inside, and you wait inside here. So I went inside, and I stopped 
because I, I was getting ready to step into a home. Now, it had one room, and she had her couch right there, and she was folding some clothes, and she had some soup or something cooking back there on the stove, and I knew that their bedroom was over here, and I stepped into that, and I felt like it was a home. It was unbelievable. And here I am going back to this mansion with six bathrooms. So the cab driver takes me to Miami. I, 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 the lady says, it looks like you're really upset. Is there anything I could do? And I said, I would like to buy a pair of those cotton socks on your couch because I was going back to Nashville, and I knew there had been a snowstorm. Actually, the airport closed down. For us, it was a pretty severe cold storm. And I had on a sundress and sandals, and I had walked out with nothing. And so I wanted a pair of those socks. And she said, honey, I'll just give you a pair of these socks. I mean, she was one of those guardian angels right there for us. And she trusted me with her husband, and they made me pay them in cash. You know, they were good business people. <laughs> and so I get to the Miami airport, and there were no planes to Nashville. There were no planes anywhere. And so I thought, I'll get a room. I've given them all my cash, but I can live on plastic. But there was a, a sailboat show and some kind of automobile race going on, and trust me, I, I'm in real estate. There were no rooms to be had. So my only option was to spend the night in the Miami airport. And I don't think this is the way it is now, but the part of the airport where I was that night was under construction, and it was open to the city, and it was not a safe place for this woman to be. And I spent the rest of the night just trying to have a little bit of safety, a little bit of deep breath, of just trying to stay out of any kind of trouble that was really obvious going on there. I was a bag lady. I was a bag lady for the night. And I said a prayer. I, with my back up against the wall, hanging on to those cotton socks, I said, God, my life is unmanageable. Now, manageable, that was in my vocabulary. I managed. I managed shopping centers. I managed to keep girls in school. I managed to have dinner parties. I managed to travel. I managed. And to, I managed to keep two secretaries busy all the time. I managed. And for me to say to myself, to God, my life is unmanageable, was, was big. I get a flight back out the next day. I end up in Nashville, Tennessee, and I don't even go to my bedroom because it's not a safe place. My oldest daughter's at college. My young daughter's with the babysitter, so I go into her bedroom. She's probably, what, eight years old, nine years old. I go into this little bed that has all the little pink stuff all around it with all the little stuffed animals, and I wait because I'd been taught to wait. My mom taught me that. So I waited for him to come home. And man, when he came home, I thought I'd seen him angry before. I was this man's fourth wife, and so I really thought I was the one that was going to make a difference. And the first thing he said to me was, no woman has ever walked out on me before. You embarrassed me, and now we're going to have a really, really bad fight. And because I was so organized, I had that thought, oh, let's go see that doctor. We always go see him when we have an argument. Remember the one that twirled the paper clip? Now, this doctor, you used to have to wait weeks ahead of time to get an appointment. But I just said, hey, I'm just trying to buy a little time here. I'm just trying to defuse the moment a little bit. And I said, let me see if I can call the doctor. And he shrugged, and I, and I had the, because I am organized, I had the number there. And the girl that answered the phone, she said, we just had somebody cancel. If you can be here within 15 minutes, the doctor can see you. God's fingerprints are all over this big story here. That, that this doctor you could never get in to see all of a sudden, we can go see. So my husband and I get in the car, and we have about a 10-minute drive to this doctor's office. And it was a 10-minute drive that must have lasted 10 years. We know that anger is very noisy. Um, a lamp against a wall, a, a, a plate hitting the floor, skin against skin. We know that anger is a very... Very scary thing and very noisy. But the silent anger in that car going to the doctor's office was absolutely deadly. It was frightening. So this is the way we were at the doctor's office this time. And this time, the doctor said, come on in. Sit down. You sit down. And he got back on his side of the desk. 
And he said, before you start to share, before you start talking, I need to tell you something. My name is Dr. So-and-so, and I am an alcoholic. And I need to make amends to my patients because I haven't always been as present as I should have been. And so from that time to the time before, this man had gotten into recovery, and he was a changed person. His face looked different, you know. And he picked up right away what was going on in our household because his household had been living it. And he said, look, to make amends to you, my wife and I were going to go on this one-week um, retreat for couples, a uh, uh, treatment center for couples. He said, here are the air tickets. Here, go up there. Here's the schedule. And so, like, the next day, we're on our way to South Dakota to spend a week at a treatment center. And uh, it's just like this big whirl. And when I first get there, I'm trying to pass the time. And, and I look over, and there are those banners with the steps and traditions, and there's that first step that says unmanageable. I thought, isn't that funny that that would kind of show up in my vocabulary again, you know? So what does this week look like with a, with a couple here that are just kind of dropped into to this uh, treatment center? You know, we arrived, my husband always said that uh, um, an airplane was one of his favorite bars, so you can imagine how we arrived at the treatment center. And, and um, it was a lovely place, and people would walk around the lake holding hands, and people would go into dinner holding hands, and people would look at the sunset holding hands. It looked like Noah's Ark. That's what it looked like. And every time it was our turn to wa- work on our relationship, they would take my husband into the other room. And I'm out there. How, how can we work on our marriage if they keep him out there? And what I know is that Alcoholics Anonymous is not about saving relationships. It's about saving lives. And they had that man in there knocking at some of his denial as far as his alcoholism and drug use was concerned. So as we finish up this week-long thing, I did learn the serenity prayer. And as I'm going back to the airport, the director gave me a hug and he said, Get yourself to Al-Anon. Now, we're up in the, uh, the Black Hills of South Dakota. I decided Al-Anon was an Indian word, you know. <laughs> I didn't have a clue as to what it was. So we're back in Nashville, Tennessee. And if you'll remember back to some of the first days of recovery, it's not all that much fun because we no longer had the tool of denial. We were having to look at some of our actions, at some of our behavior. Things were really bad in our household. Just on the weekends, during the week I could hide out at work, but weekends went on forever. And we'd had a really long weekend, and I'm at my very organized office Monday morning. I'm ready to start my day, and I'm absolutely falling apart. And I remembered what the man said, and and I looked up Alan on in the phone book. And I'm so grateful for anybody that ever answers a phone at intergroup office or central office because you are literally saving lives. I call this number, and I don't know what to ask. I don't know anything about it. I don't know what's going on in my own life, in my own head. But the woman says, where are you? And so I told her where my very organized business was. And she says, it's amazing. There's a new meeting that just started, and it's only about two blocks from your office, and it comes on at noon from 12 to 1. I'm looking at my day planner. Oh, I could go over there. She said, you go over there, and they'll give you a schedule. They'll give you some literature. They'll give you some information. She said, you just go over there. And I thought, one hour, I don't have a power lunch today. I could go over there. They probably want me to donate some money or something. But she said, go over there. So I'm gonna, I was desperate enough. I'm going to go over there. So I go to the Monday midday downtown Al-Anon family group meeting. It's still my home group today, 19, 20, almost 20 years later. And I want to tell you who the woman was that stood on this side of the door getting ready to go into her first Al-Anon meeting. Man, you looked at me and you'd say, what a woman that's got it all together. Doesn't she look sharp? And doesn't she do a great job with her business transaction? And I'm absolutely dying inside. I'm running my household, which is supposed to be the comfort, home sweet home situation for for family. I'm running it like a military camp. My high school daughter is beginning her journey into drugs and alcohol. My husband is bottoming out on his journey into drugs and alcohol and some other hobbies that wouldn't help for an intimate relationship, like a marriage. (laughs) And our eight-year-old 
is in precocious puberty. What that meant, her eight-year-old body had turned into that of a young teenage girl. Her hormones are bouncing off the wall. The mom, the one that's giving comfort, the one that's in charge, I have no spiritual connect, I have no idea what's going on, and I am in early menopause. Do you think our house wasn't a war zone? (laughs) It was a war zone. We had separate bedrooms, we had separate TVs, we did not share meals, we did not have eye contact on the way to the bathroom in the hallway because it was not safe. We, we were just living in, uh, you know, I, don't, I can't even watch some of that, that TV show where all those people are living in that house together because it, 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 our house was so unhappy. It was so terribly unhappy. And it's like we were trapped there. I look back on those days and I'm thinking, what, what was I doing? What was I doing? What was I really, really doing? And what I was doing on a daily basis, I was trying to please the disease. That's what I was doing. And the disease can't be pleased. It wants more. It's greedy. It wants it all. It wants everything and then some. So that's what I was trying to do is just please the disease. So I opened up the door to go into my first Al-Anon meeting, and I said, what's that noise? And you said, that's laughter. Come on in. Because <laughs> it had been a long time since I'd heard that wonderful belly laughter that we have in meetings. I absolutely crave it. I just I love what Cliff said about laughter last night. If, if, we, if we can connect with the laughter, it is like we're coming home. It is like we're coming to a safe place because it is safe laughter. Now, as a newcomer in Al-Anon, I did what I see newcomers do today. I start calling it, I learned to, I, I kept trying to, I kept sing, singing the hymns. And you know, there's no singing. Oh, but there is. Him did this and him did that. <laughs> and that's what I would do when I'd go to those Al-Anon meetings. But I have to tell you, I took to it. I took to Al-Anon like somebody taken to oxygen for the first time. I started going to a lot of meetings. I got a sponsor. I started working the steps. I picked a sponsor that had been married 10 years in recovery. I'm still trying to hang on to that second marriage. And what I know now through Al-Anon and working the steps, that, that I had a right to honor a marriage. And I had a right to ask for some things from a marriage. But I didn't have a right to ask them from somebody that possibly wasn't available to give them to me. So that marriage ended in divorce. We had uh, some, some years in recovery, and then it ended in divorce. And it, and it went on a long time, and it was really ugly because there was a lot of business involved. And um, it, 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 was, it was not a pleasant time. But Al-Anon did me well through that storm. And I keep that man in my prayers every day because that's how I got to Al-Anon. If I hadn't gone through all of that dance with him, I might not have been able to hang out with you wonderful people. So that's my story. I, uh, I'm now in Al-Anon. I'm now, now divorced. Uh, I get a sponsor. I start working the steps. And I start having what I call um, understandings. This is what I got by working the steps. I got a God of my understanding. I got an incredible you of my understanding. And I got an own personal me of my understanding just by working the steps. Uh, the, the God of my understanding that I brought into Al-Anon could best be described like a, like a referee at a sporting event. I'd be going along doing life and a whistle would blow and bam, I'm going to get punished some way. That's the God I brought into Al-Anon. But from you, I learned that the God could be gentle, could be non-judgmental, and could be available through prayer and meditation. I ended up with this unbelievable gentle God. And... Um, One way that helped me do that was seeing the God that you described and hearing your stories. And then one day my daughter, this uh, wonderful, beautiful teenage daughter, um, I I couldn't understand why she didn't stop drinking after I got into Al-Anon because she'd seen what it had done to our family, you know. And I have to tell you that the most beautiful words this daughter ever said to me, they were not, Mom, I love you. The most beautiful words that daughter ever said was, Hi, Mom, my name's Jamie, and I'm an alcoholic. Because with those words, I knew that there was a hope because I'd seen it happen in your family. And this August, she will celebrate 17 years in AA. (laughs) And that applause is for Alcoholics Anonymous. 
They parented her so beautifully. You know, I, I, I couldn't do it. It, it. I couldn't do it. In fact, she says that one of her turning points was um, I'd been hanging around long enough that I'd kind of picked up on that uh, thing of detachment. My daughter is a college grad. She's newly sober. And she's coming home every night with a bunch of friends from the club, and they're, they're, they're at our house, and they're playing cards all night. And then she's sleeping all day. But she's sober, so I don't want to interfere with that. But one day I, I thought, wait a minute, she's not looking for a job. I thought, she's not being mature. And so she came downstairs, and I handed her part of the water bill and her part of the electric bill and her part of the phone bill. And she now says, Mom, the day you treated me like an adult was the day I believed I could be one. She got sober at uh, 21, sober 17 years, and she's now the mom. Her husband's sober. This is the parents that are raising our grandchildren. And what I see about them is that they're available. They're not looking out the window waiting for him to come home. They're not worried about if they're going to have money for the electric bill. They're very, very available to our grandchildren. Um, the, the twins are four. I'll tell you a little side story. The twins are four, and, the, and the, their, their little brother is two. But we had to, I went with Jamie to take the boys to a well visit. I hope this will be w- well received. So we're going to the doctor to, for a well visit for the twins, and we have the baby. And we've had to wait outside for quite a while. It's a regular doctor and then the pediatrician. And then they put us in this tiny room. You know what that looks like. So we have these two two two-year-olds running around. I have to tell you, I did not know there was that much paper on one of those rolls. I did not know that. (laughs) And and these guys are bouncing off the wall. And, you know, and so the doctor finally comes in. And Jamie and I are exhausted. And the baby's crying. And the little boys are running around. And, and the doctor knows the history uh, that, you know, it's a family in recovery. And I said, I said I, I'm watching these little alcoholics and this, this run around here, you know, it's just, you know. And she, the doctor says, no, 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 no. Don't put that label on these little guys. She says, it's not that two-year-olds act like alcoholics. It's that alcoholics act like two-year-olds. <laughs> That, that's a professional quote, okay? <laughs> so Jamie comes to me and uh, and and, tell, and she's got she's gonna she's sober, you know. And so things didn't go well until I got out of her face and out of her stuff. But I'm still kind of looking for this uh, friendly God, and and some healing had happened. And Jamie had come over for dinner. She had moved out, and she came back for dinner. And as, as she's leaving, she says, "Mom, would you like to pray with me?" And Man, I started hearing the Hallmark card commercial music in the background, you know. I mean, this is an incredible moment. And uh, I must have had a funny look. I said, yes, Jamie, I would like to pray with you. And she goes, okay. And so I got down on my knees, and she got down on her knees. And in the voice of my daughter, the way she started her prayer changed the God of my understanding. She just said, hi, God. (laughs) It's me and my mom, and we want to talk to you. And so that's how I got a more gentle God. And that's the kind of God I needed to hold my hand when I went into that dark cave of steps four and five. Okay? If I had not had, if my God had not been big enough and strong enough and on my side, I could never have faced my steps four and five. I I married young. I felt like I had to make up for lost time. I was divorced twice. My sponsor did not doze off during my fifth step, let me tell you. (laughs) I was out there, out there doing the deal. So I had to have this friendly God to help me through those steps four and five. And I got in touch with all the things that we do. I got in touch with those aren't, that's not who I am because I'm no longer doing those things. And I got in touch with that there was a lot of grieving that I had to do. And I think this was one of my biggest lessons in steps four and five. I had to grieve the losses. The disease had cost me a lot. My parents not being so available to me, my not being available to my girls, my not living happily ever after in marriage one and marriage two and all the other relationships that went by the wayside. My biggest grieving had to be grieving around the loss of the dreams. And once I realized that that's what they were, I could grieve. And grieving is a process, and I could get through that. And then the good stuff, once the grieving was gone, then the good stuff could come in. And that's what helped me. There, there, there are two ways that we can grieve dreams. We can grieve a dream because it's 
not going to come true, and we realize that it's a loss. We can also grieve a dream because it comes true, and that's a real tricky thing. I have a friend that desperately wanted to go back to college, and her husband had gone all the way and gotten a Ph.D. She would helped put her kids through college, and finally one September she was going to get to go to college. By, um, by later in the winter she called me and she says, I'm absolutely crazy. I said, what's going on with you? And after she described it, she realized that she didn't have a dream. Her dream had come true. She got in college. So she was grieving the loss of the dream. So what I know about myself is that grieving is a part of my recovery. I, I have to grieve, and that means tears, and that means some anger sometime, and that still means I'm holding that hand of that wonderful, loving God all the way through this process. And what else I learned about myself, the me of my understanding by doing this? I guess... Uh, I didn't, couldn't tell you what I like to do or how I like to spend my time because it was never safe. If, uh, in that former marriage, if I had picked a restaurant and we had gotten a restaurant that I might like to go to, like a Chinese restaurant, I'd like to try this new Chinese restaurant. Well, if we had gone there and if we'd gotten bad food or, or poor service, it would be my fault. I got blamed when the car had a flat tire. See, that's why it was so hard for me to take step one. It seemed like I had a lot of power. I was told I had the power. We, I can't believe that we had to wait in line to get this movie ticket. It was your fault, some way. So I thought if I had the blame for everything, that I must, must have the, also the means to make him happy. So it was really hard for me to catch on to that step one. But after I got that and I went through the rest of these steps, I can tell you who I am. And for the first time in my life, my spiritual age, my physical age, my emotional age, my chronological age have kind of all shown up at the same time. I used to be a grown-up girl with a little scary kid inside. When I was a little kid, I was so mature. Everybody always said, isn't she sweet? It must be because she's an only child. She never talks out of turn. She never makes trouble. I was so grown up when I was little. Finally, through working these steps, all of me has kind of shown up at the same time. I can tell you what I like to do. I like to sing off key. I like to dance off step. <laughs> I like to paint with strange colors. I like to hang out with people in recovery. You know, I, I like being in Al-Anon. It, it literally saved my life with an incident with a gun. You don't wrestle with another adult around a gun. And I heard the word detach, and I backed way off, and I probably saved a homicide suicide. You did, by letting me hear the word detach. So Al-Anon literally saved my life, and it changed my life, and now it's a wonderful way of life. It's just so incredible. And the you of my understanding that I came to love and care about, let me tell you who the, the you out there was that I brought into Al-Anon. If you were female, I thought you were after my man. And if you were male, I thought you were after me. And that's the way I divided the whole world before I got into Al-Anon. And I can tell you who you are. You look back at the, at the steps. And the number one, the first word is a we. They say stick with the winners. It looks like we're in first place. That's who you are. You made a decision to come here on a weekend and sit yourself in a chair you are the winners. That's who you are. The other word I love to describe you, and that's the word restore, that shows up in our steps. I've hung out with a lot of antiques. I've bought a lot of antiques. I've bought a lot of art in, in my lifetime. And what I know about antiques and what I know about art, nothing is restored unless it had something that was of worth and value. Unless it was a treasure, then you don't take the time to restore it. Sometimes you have a piece of furniture and you've got to put some pretty harsh chemicals on it and you've got to scrub it pretty good. Does that sound like your sponsor? <laughs> Sometimes you have to do some pretty extreme measure to restore. Sometimes you have a delicate painting and you have to restore it with just a little bit brush, just a little bit of strokes at a time. But you don't put energy in restoring anything unless it had worth and value. You are a treasure. You have worth and you have value. And, and you and, and myself, I'm, I'm worthy of recovery. We're worthy of recovery. And that, that's how, what I know of the understanding. Um, the rest of the steps help me get along with other people. I, I think that God wants us to do this work. When I made my amends step, I, I, f I found everybody that I needed to making those formal amends, except one woman. 
Um, I'd seen her at a meeting, and she talked about infidelity, and I wasn't ready to hear about it. So after the meeting, I would gossip about her. I'd criticize her. I'd talk bad about her, and she showed up on my list. And when I got ready to make amends to her, I couldn't find her. And nobody remembered her like I did. And I didn't know her last name, so I could not find this woman. And I'm desperate to get through these steps. I very much want to do this work. And so my experience is usually in the morning, I go out on a spring day on my back deck. But for some reason, in the morning, I'm sitting on my front step with my ODAT book that faces the street. And I'm kind of looking down, and I'm kind of praying. God, I've, I've made all these other amends. They went so great with my family members, with the people I worked with. But, but I can't find this woman, and I, I want to get on with these steps. I'm going to meet my sponsor tonight, and I want to get on with these steps. And I look up, and this woman is walking down my street. <laughs> I think she's a ghost that I've conjured up, you know. Now, here's the video. A perky lady in her uh, jogging suit going down this little street. And here's a woman still in her nightgown with long hair. And I come running out and I'm going, it's you, it's you. you know? <laughs> and she kind of backs up. <laughs> and so I, I make my amends to her. And the way I, my sponsor taught me to make my amends, she said, you have a tendency to pick and scabs. Ugh. She said, you're not going to make amends and have to make amends on the way you made amends. <laughs> so my sponsor gave me about ten words I could say when I made the amends. And so I said that to this woman and made my amends to her. And she said, I, I, okay, I don't remember that incident, but I do know about amends. And so she accepted them. And she's looking kind of funny. And I said, what's going on with you? And she said, well, I was trying to figure out what street this is. She says, I, I live about two blocks around the corner. I walk almost every day, and, and I've really never been down this little side street before. Do you think God doesn't want us to do this work? This is what I believe. And I was going through the steps several years later, and I had an uneasiness. And I couldn't figure that out because I just told you this incredible story. So I went to God in prayer, my friendly God, I held his hand, and I said, I really need some help here. And I was given the thought, the suggestion, the solution maybe of my uneasiness, and I was given the opportunity to make good amends. I had been doing my life so focused on the disease that I had neglected to say thank you. And I tracked down my speech coach from high school, and I said, thank you for getting me off the back row and getting me active in high school events. I found that lady that gave me those socks, and I said, thank you. And I made the list, and I was as diligent about that as I was about my formal amends. And the only thing I said was, I wasn't as present as I should have been, and I just need to say thank you. You were important to me. For what it's worth, that was my good amends. So. Single woman doing life great, have balance because of a recovery, but I'm lonely. I said a prayer. God, I don't want to ask for anything because I had a dog, a cat, a rabbit, a fish. <laughs> don't want to ask for anything, but I need you to know that I'm lonely. And I said that prayer, and a couple of days later, my girlfriend said, uh, did you know that Scott's divorce is going to be final? I go, Scott's divorce? I had been going to an open AA meeting Never to talk, never to share, but my sponsor had me going to the open AA meeting to hear the stories of hope and to hear the stories about the disease. So I've been going for an open AA meeting for almost as long as I've been going to Al-Anon. Never, I never shared in it. I just listened. But I'd seen this guy over there, and I thought he must be the, have the most incredible life. I loved in his attitude when he would share. He just was so great. And now my friends told me that he's going to be divorced. And she said, where have you been? He hasn't even lived in his household for almost three years. I thought, hmm, that was information I wasn't supposed to have. <laughs> so now I've got this information. I'm lonely. He's going to be available. I'm lonely. He's going to be available. And I, and I changed my behavior without even knowing it. I, I'm just thinking about this all the time. And so I'm, I, I bolted out of the meeting one day after it was over, and Scott stepped right in front of me. And he said, uh, can I ask you something? And I said, well, yes. He said, have I done something to offend you? And I said, no, why do you ask that? And he said, well, 
He said, you never go to lunch with us after the meeting. You never say hello. You never stop for hugs. You never have eye contact. And he said, I just wondered if I'd done something to offend you. And I said, well, I found out that you're going to be available, and I'm interested. (laughs) And he said, oh, (laughs) and I bolted for my car. (laughs) We didn't have cell phones. I had to wait till I got home to call my sponsor. I said, he said this, and I said that. And she said, I think it's going to be okay because it sounds like you just told the truth. (laughs) But I thought, but why couldn't I have been more clever? You know, I... (laughs) I kept thinking I I was supposed to have a plan. I was supposed to control it. And wonderful turn of events. Scott became single. He asked me out. We dated. We courted. Oh, we courted. It was so gorgeous and so beautiful. And in December, we'll celebrate 11 years of marriage. And it's great. And we're living happily ever after. And, And we're living happily ever after with the program. We have an AA phone line that comes into our household. We have an Al-Anon phone line that comes into our household. We do not work each other's programs. We do have permission at any given time to ask two questions. The first question is, how long has it been since you've been to a meeting? And the other person will not be upset by that. And the second question is, would you be willing to talk to your sponsor about that? That's all. And we, we have agreement ahead of time. And that helps so much, you know. Uh, that the other person won't be upset. So here I am going through the steps, and I had the spiritual awaken as promised in the step 12. And I have to tell you what my spiritual awakening has been is that I have choices. I didn't know I had the choices to say, yes, I'll go to a meeting. I didn't know I had the choices to say no. I didn't know that I had choices until I got into Al-Anon. I also didn't know that my disease is one of amnesia, I forget what I've learned. I forget what you've taught me. So to help me remember that I have the wonderful, wonderful gift of working these steps, I have the spiritual awakening of choice. I go to an old story. Long ago in this village, there was a wise old man, and everybody loved him. They thought he was just incredible. And there was a young boy in the village, and I guess in this day and age, you would say this young boy had an attitude. He was jealous of the old man, and he wanted to show him up. So the young boy came up with this unbelievable scheme. The scheme was this. The boy was going to catch a baby bird, and he was going to put it behind his back, and he was going to go to the old man, and he was going to ask the old man if the bird was dead or alive. And if the old man said, well, son, that bird is alive, well, the boy was going to crush the bird, kill it, and show the old man the dead bird. Or if the old man said, well, son, that bird is dead, well, then the boy was just going to show him the live bird. I mean, it was a great, great plan. He was probably a pre-Alanon coming up with such a plan. (laughs) So they call the whole village together. The old man is there. The young boy picks up the baby bird, and he puts it behind his back, and he says, okay, old man, you're so all-knowing. You tell me whether or not this bird is dead or alive. And the old man said, son, the choice is yours. (laughs) So sometimes when I want to have a, a be a brat and I have a spiritual flat tire, I, I don't want to call my sponsor. I don't want to call my sponsor. The, the shade is way dark, and, and I have a choice. I have a choice whether to reach out or whether to, to, to isolate. And I'm so happy that I said yes when they called and asked me to come here. And the last thing I would like to say is that there is absolutely, I believe this with all my heart, There's absolutely no limit to how happy God wants you to be. God bless. Thank you. Thank you.